All right, good morning. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Paul Ferraro. I'm the Vice President of Sea Power Capability Systems. Uh, within Raytheon's Integrated Defense Systems. And it's my honor this morning to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Eric Evans. Dr. Evans is a director of MIT Lincoln Lab, a multidisciplinary FFRDC run by MIT for the Department of Defense. Lincoln Labs, located just outside of Boston, employs over 3,800 of the nation's sharpest minds who focus their efforts on advancing technology development and systems, uh, systems prototyping for national security needs. Their services are critical, a critical resource supporting innovative efforts within government agencies such as DARPA, NOAA, NASA, and the FAA. As director, Dr. Evans is responsible for charting the laboratory's strategic direction, overseeing its technical and administrative, administrative operations. Dr. Evans, thank you for joining us today. You bring, a van, you bring a unique vantage point to the development of some of the nation's most cutting edge technology. We all look forward to hearing your insights. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Eric Evans. So Paul, thank you, and uh, I'm very glad to be here this morning to talk to you about innovation, something uh, near and dear to what we do at, at Lincoln Laboratory. And if I could have the next chart, please. I, th I thought I would start by highlighting in one chart uh, what we do at Lincoln, a little deeper than what Paul had just described. So we are a federally funded research and development center. We're run by MIT on behalf of the DOD. And our mission is technology in support of national security, which is about 99% uh, DOD related uh, for us. And we do a lot of uh, what we call system architecture engineering. We look at how big systems come together, what sensors, networks, and uh, in some cases, weapons coming together around new, new approaches. We do long-term technology developments. So we might look out 15 or 20 years in various areas. And we do system prototyping and demonstration on a very large scale. Uh, at any given time at Lincoln, we might have between 15 and 20 very large projects at the scale of 20 to 250 million dollars over a, a few years to create the first copy of something. And then when we're done, we transition out of the laboratory, uh, everything to industry or into operations, and we, we move on to, to something new. We have 10 mission areas, everything from air, missile, and maritime defense, uh, homeland protection. Uh, we're doing a lot in the comm area now. And uh, I'll mention some of the laser comm work we're doing shortly. Uh, Cybersecurity work for us is growing almost exponentially, and uh, it overlays almost everything that we do. Uh, we're doing a lot of space systems and technology work, looking at the future space weapon system that should be coming together. And uh, we're doing a lot with ISR systems and, and tactical systems. We're about a billion dollars in funding now. And uh, in any given year, we might spend between two or three hundred million dollars just to buy things that we bring in for the prototype. So for the, the, the companies around the room here, we're very interested in talking to you about what you might have to offer for the, the various projects we have ongoing right now. We're, we're looking forward to connecting with you in, in any way that, uh, that you can. And uh, we're about 4,000 employees. That's about 70 percent technical. And uh, we have been uh, very busy over the past few years, and the, the funding looks very stable for us, despite you know, some of the uncertainty in the R&D area. Next chart. So I thought I'd talk about the what of innovation first. And uh, uh, Paul mentioned my role at Lincoln Laboratory, but I'm also part-time the vice chairman of the Defense Science Board. And this chart is a product of, of many discussions, beginning with uh, Bob Work, uh, later with Pat Shanahan and others, about how to integrate uh, a master plan for some of the, the systems needed for the nation's defense. And this chart is put in the form of deterrence. You know, ultimately, what we hope for is greater deterrence. And it shows uh, three levels, uh, strategic deterrence, and then conventional and tactical deterrence, and then what's called uh, gray zone deterrence, and, and uh, that comes by, by many names. And uh, to start at the strategic level, things have changed a lot over the past uh, several years. So it's not just about nuclear strategic deterrence anymore. It's about uh, cyber and biological defense. Uh, those two areas now have near existential threats out there. And we used to talk about the escalation ladder, now the discussions are more around the escalation lattice and uh, cross-domain deterrence. And uh, how do you control escalation within this lattice? It's a very complicated problem. And there's a need for new systems that provide effects that are more reversible 
so that we can manage the escalation uh, within this lattice of effects, nuclear, cyber, and biological. So there, there's a lot of new technology and a lot of uh, new innovation needed in that area. Uh, in the conventional and tactical area, of course, there's power projection and counter A2AD and the whole range of uh, uh, systems that have been under developed now for, for years. Uh, but there's the, the complication of the rise of tactical nuclear weapons for some uh, cases. And uh, there are key system needs. Now, we've, uh, over the years, been talking about uh, offset strategies. And there are different forms of those uh, the, in the, this chart in the middle, uh, those five topics, I, in full disclosure, are my thoughts. But uh, persistent sensing, uh, long range quality at uh, quantity at low cost is very much needed now uh, for taking our asymmetric advantages. Uh, we have a whole range of ideas for systems that have uh, uh, distributed value or disaggregation, whether it's in the air or on the surface or uh, under sea or even in space. And uh, of course, uh, unmanned systems and autonomy are a key part of the future for innovation. And there's a whole range of work going on. It was very nice to see some of the uh, company work going on in the displays outside here. And then uh, looking at the full effects chain, uh, finding ways to move up the effects chain to find networks and, and get more advantage. And then in the, the bottom layer, the gray zone layer, there is a lot of work needed. In fact, there's probably more actions going on now in the gray zone, below the threshold of typical warfare than above. And you all, I'm, I'm sure, are aware we're in the middle of a massive information campaign going on right now. And uh, we need better systems for indications and warning, ways of shining the light on uh, situations which may not be accurate. And uh, there's this whole concept of how does the U.S. mount its information campaign within the ethical structure that we have within uh, our country. And in a similar way for conventional, we need to have reversible effects and also some covert effects on the menu. We don't have enough of those right now. And many of those involve innovation and technology. And uh, so together, uh, this chart captures a lot of what is needed at, at a high level. Uh, if we're weak at the strategic level, we invite escalation out of the conventional level. If we're weak at the conventional level, we invite escalation out of the gray zone. So there's a, there's a grand strategy to come together that uh, integrates all that and uh, highlights how we manage escalation across all layers. So there's a lot of work to do. And uh, you all have a role in this. And uh, uh, we, we invite the discussion to figure out what we might uh, develop to populate the various areas within uh, this chart. Next chart. So one of the impediments is this. <laughs> so we've had a lot of discussions about this over the years. And, and there are many uh, thoughts for how to deal with this, uh, whether to start over, which I, I think is probably a, a, a bridge too far, or to create a rapid development path uh, with various models, RCO models and OTA models and others out there. And uh, so I, I think uh, perhaps the parallel path that grows over time uh, might be the better model, but there's, there's a lot that has to be fixed in here. Uh, I was involved recently in a defense industrial base study in response to the White House executive order, and uh, we had a whole series of uh, industry CEOs and former CEOs come through, and their, their top uh, input was, uh, if we don't fix this, uh, we're, we, we're not uh, really focusing on the, the right problem. So there is a lot of attention being paid with this. Uh, I'll highlight some areas to create a parallel path, uh, but I, uh, it's, after the presentation, I'd be happy to talk with any of you about your thoughts and how we can do better here. Next chart. So this is a, a higher level uh, industrial base model that we've used within the Defense Science Board and within the DOD. And just going uh, uh, clockwise around it, there's operational input that informs uh, system development and, and technology priorities. There's a period of prototyping and demonstration. There can be a transition in two ways, sometimes directly into operations, sometimes, uh, in fact, most often into the industry base, and there's a supply chain uh, supporting that. So it's a, a higher level extraction of what happens in the, in the prior chart. Uh, next chart. And you can look at this around the circle again and figure out where some of the problems are. There, there are a lot of discussions about valleys of death. Well, there are many valleys of death uh, across that development cycle. Uh, one, which I think is very serious, is sometimes there's not enough uh, operational input. In fact, uh, sometimes that's absent from some of the technology decisions that are made uh, within the DOD. 
sometimes at the at the system level, uh, the system concept is just a minor evolution of what we have. And, and uh, in, in cases where we want to find our asymmetric advantages, we have to take some major leaps into some new areas beyond uh, what we're evolving from. And in some cases, the technology isn't mature. And it's not mature because we're not making those long-term investments to get it ready to move into systems. Moving around the chart a little bit further, uh, sometimes there are demonstrations or test campaigns where uh, there really isn't much risk taken on because the, they're designed to succeed and we need to take on more risk. I'll, I'll talk about a project shortly that attempted to do that. Uh, sometimes there are organizations around the country developing new technologies and new systems and they're not including industry early enough. And so there's a, there's a, a gap between taking it out of the laboratories into industry uh, production and, uh, and making the, the results more manufacturable. manufacturable. That's a very uh, serious problem that has to be addressed. Uh, and moving around a little bit further, uh, very often the transition and production funding is not programmed. And that's more in the 6-4 category. So there's a great technology development program, and there are visions for a great acquisition program to occur someday. But there's no 6-4 funding to get it moving in that direction. And there can be a, a year or two gap to get that, that going. So we've been putting some programs in place to pr try to provide the DOD with a larger pool of that 6-4 funding to, to jump start getting more programs uh, into acquisition. Uh, we all could be working to uh, uh, design adaptability more into systems and uh, to make the processor and software upgrades uh, uh, easier to do. Uh, in the supply chain, uh, there's been a lot of effort uh, put into thinking about vulnerabilities here. And, and there's a whole long briefing around uh, some of the issues that has been pulled together over the past summer. But uh, one of the major problems is uh, that some aspects of our supply chains are under attack. And we need to recognize that. And we need to start designing ways around those systems. I can't go into detail about uh, the types of attacks and where they're occurring and everything. Uh, but we have to recognize it's, it's more than, than just, uh, just industry. It's about the whole supply chain. Some of those supply chains go into foreign countries. Some of them have uh, links that are vulnerable. And we have to do a whole uh, end-to-end uh, -end view of, of the vulnerabilities of that, that system, and that's underway right now. And then in the transition to the operations side, ultimately, uh, we have to uh, make sure that there's a good CONOPS, of course, but uh, very often we hear that the, uh, the funding for training is not available for something new that came out. In fact, this was a major problem with IED technology transitioning out to Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, there wasn't enough time nor funding to get, get the technology in, into the hands of soldiers in a way that they knew how to use everything. So that has to be designed in early. And, uh, and then very often, uh, in some cases, we've reviewed the readiness and sustainment funding is not available, which creates problems uh, longer term. So I didn't cover everything in here, but you can see this is a, this is a whole system problem. It's not just about focusing on industry. It's not just focusing on the supply chain or innovation as a topic. It's about looking at the whole system problem of development and making sure that we have all the programs and the approaches in place to get over some of the, the valleys of death that uh, create impediments for a whole range of problems that we all know about. Uh, so there's been a lot of thinking put into this, but not enough. And uh, we, uh, again, we invite your input on what we might do uh, to add some additional measures on a chart like this. Next chart. So just to give you an example of a, a system that was developed years ago that I think uh, took on a lot of risk and uh, was a, a consortium of uh, industry efforts, uh, laboratory efforts with a, a strong uh, government technical uh, presence. And this is with the E2C radar modernization. And uh, some of you may know that the system uh, was built uh, in the early days uh, uh, with the APS-145 uh, system. When the Navy was uh, moving forward from the sea for some missions, it was uh, recognized that the radar didn't perform as well uh, near land with reflections from mountains and towers and buildings coming in through the antenna side lobes and swamping out small targets that it, it was looking for. So there was a push to find a way to mitigate all that. And the approach that was developed by many working together was something called space-time adaptive processing, or STAP, which allowed the system to steer a beam electronically to look for a small target and then simultaneously listen to the environment and, and null out jammers and clutter that might be competing uh, with those targets. 
And uh, to do that, there were new systems needed, new antennas, new receivers, digital receivers that were very small, uh, new processors for inverting uh, large matrices in real time to do the processing. Uh, that technology occurred across the community. Uh, much of it was high risk, actually, but uh, the risk was reduced over time. Uh, when ready, there was a, a prototype E2 built on a mountaintop site out at Kauai, and that's shown in the upper right-hand side of the view graph. And uh, had a number of components that were uh, uh, also higher risk that I can't go into that were under development. And uh, the result was a whole test campaign. There were real Aegis ships off the coast. The system was looking beyond the horizon of the ships to direct fire. Uh, it was uh, adapting uh, for jamming and various clutter threats uh, that were out there. And uh, in the lower right-hand corner, there's a plot showing signal strength versus range from the radar. If, if we weren't doing the processing, we get the, the red curve, which is showing a, a lot of clutter coming in, swapping out targets. If we could null that out, we'd get the black curve, which is showing a target coming in at right around uh, 155. Uh, kilometers away. So once this was done, this was about a $95 million prototyping effort. There were probably five or six high-risk components that were under development for this. It was a very well-designed industry laboratory consortium for developing the component, components. Everything came together, and then when it was done, everything transitioned to the, the main industry primes to create the, the various components and integrate uh, everything together into the E2D program, a multi-billion dollar program. But this is an example. This was a, about a 10-year effort. And it was a whole uh, integrated plan to reduce the risk, to get the technology ready, to take some very uh, uh, major jumps into the innovation uh, direction for this system. And as a result, I think the Navy is uh, uh, now uh, in, in uh, use of a very, very uh, important new capability, a new radar system that can handle the threat that we have out there. And this system came together well. It was, uh, there were uh, some highs and lows along the way. Um, but there was an aspect of it that was a, a total failure. And uh, it was my fault. So I wanted to, to mention that. Uh, you can imagine with a radar system like this, so you're up high, you can look down. Uh, you might be able to use a, a radar like this for doing uh, defense of, of cities against low-flying cruise missiles. So we were thinking about ways of uh, demonstrating that. And uh, we had to come up uh, rapidly with a, a test target to represent a low-flying cruise missile. And uh, the constraints were it had to be fast, it had to represent something flying low, it had to have the right radar cross-section. And uh, we, we, couldn't, uh, we couldn't spend a lot of money on it, and we had to do it in about a month. So we went through a whole range of options, and uh, I, I, I put a fair amount of time in this. And on the next chart, this is what we came up with. I came <laughs> so the idea was we'd rent a Corvette. And then we'd put a, a, a pole on it. We'd, cram it full of radar absorbing material. On the top of the pole, there's a, a missile surrogate with a special uh, radar cross-section uh, carefully designed. And the thought was that the Corvette with a fiberglass body and a low profile would have a low radar reflection in the back uh, return towards the radar, what we'd have up on top of the mountaintop looking down uh, at the system. And for this to work, the radar reflections from the Corvette had to be a lot lower than the radar reflections from the missile surrogate. So we didn't have time to do uh, you know, a massive electromagnetic calculation uh, for the Corvette. And we didn't have time to take a Corvette to a compact range. We just uh, gut feel. We thought it would work. Got the Corvette, put it together. And we got clearance to uh, ride across the White Sands missile range at about 90 miles an hour. Uh, not quite cruise missile speed, but, but <laughs> and we did about, we did about five test runs, and we collect the data with that uh, E2 surrogate on a, on a mountaintop site uh, at the White Sands uh, missile range. And we looked at the data, and the, it, was, uh, it was a total failure. And uh, so it turns out that the radar reflections from a Corvette are huge. <laughs> now, this should worry you if you drive a Corvette and you're worried about police radar. So it, what happened was the radar energy went through the fiberglass body, off the engine, off the fan blade, blade splattered all over Doppler space, just, just made a big mess. And, uh, and the reflections from the car uh, swamped out the target. So 
Uh, that was about a $100,000 test. That was a bad day. Uh, and so we had to regroup. There were about seven or eight of us on the range, and uh, we looked around and, and thought, you know, how can we recover from this? And it turns out we had, a, we had this big bread truck on the range as well with a lot of flat surfaces on it. So we thought, well, maybe with the flat surfaces, the radar energy would reflect off and go into directions that didn't matter for the radar collection we were making. We did some quick calculations. We, we thought that might work. So we, we took the pole off the Corvette and the missile. We bolted it to the side of the, the bread truck. We took the Corvette back. And then we drove the bread truck in at, at 60 miles an hour, not, not 90. And that worked great. So the, the bread truck was 10,000 times lower in cross-section than the, the Corvette. And uh, in the end, we had a very successful test, and we did all the demonstration we needed to do. But the reason for going through that story is uh, almost every project that I've been involved in, and I'm sure many of you have been involved in with prototyping, uh, there are almost always a series of small to medium scale failures that lead to ultimate success. And we need to think about these projects in this way. We need to take on these risks to, to uh, work uh, through the failures that pop up that we learn from and make the, the program better uh, in the end. And that, that 5,000 series approach, that chart I put up, is not designed to integrate risk into the programs we have. So I, I think you know, one message is somehow uh, we have to change the mentality and work through a system where we can take on uh, greater risks and fail along the way and recover and, and ultimately end up with uh, what we need uh, better for the long term. And uh, I, I'm sure many of us have stories like this about uh, some of the, the challenges that, that have come up that you've worked through. But it's a very important part of innovation and it's a very important part of creating some of those new systems we need in that table chart I mentioned. Next chart. So another aspect of innovation is sustained technology investment. And the example I wanted to go through is with something called an avalanche photodiode uh, array uh, that can detect individual photons. And the idea here is you create a, a PN junction that's biased such that if you have a single photon hit it, you get an avalanche of electrons and you can, uh, you can detect uh, ind individual photons in a very sensitive way and get a, a range uh, through the timing and very accu accurate uh, angle information by using the, the actual array of pixels that are detecting photons. And there have been a range of these developed over the years at various sizes. Uh, and the, the, the point here is that uh, on the next chart, this didn't happen. If, this didn't happen over, over a couple of years. There was a sustained investment over, over a decade to get these avalanche photodiode arrays together, tested, uh, developed at scales larger uh, that were needed for uh, new systems for doing uh, LADAR sensing or, or COM uh, sensing. And this chart just shows a timeline. The blue dots are uh, internal investments that were funded uh, through the Department of Defense. And then the red circles are showing various prototype systems that flowed out of that. And uh, some of the prototype systems were rudimentary. Uh, the real systems that were beneficial to operational use really didn't happen until after 2010. So sometimes there isn't a recognition that there needs to be a sustained investment uh, needed in various technology areas. And uh, these, su these sustained investments need to be aligned to some roadmap out there. And, uh, and that kind of roadmap hasn't always been clear uh, to many of us. And uh, I, I'm very pleased that we, I think many of us in this room have probably had some uh, uh, interaction with Mike Griffin. Uh, so he is pushing in the direction of, of, of laying out a, a longer term plan with long term investments to, to drive what we need for some of these uh, systems uh, that align with that table chart uh, earlier. Uh, but uh, the sustained investment issue is something that I think is uh, critically important to driving innovation for the systems we need for the long term. Next chart. So what comes from this? So one example is a system called Machete. Uh, this is a LADAR system that was put on to uh, uh, turboprop uh, platform shown in, in the upper left-hand side and the lower left there's a, the sensor. It's a, a LADAR system with the avalanche photodiode arrays. So uh, very sensitive uh, individual photons trigger the system for uh, measuring range. There's some processing on the aircraft and then there's some processing on the ground to uh, get uh, uh, so, sort of a virtual view of some of the data collected. And uh, this came together uh, relatively rapidly after the technology was developed uh, over about 
two or three years, and uh, it was transitioned to the Southern Command for uh, looking uh, for uh, bad behavior within uh, uh, jungles that they were concerned about. And uh, on the, the next chart, I wanted to show you an example of some of the data that is collected from this now after that long-term investment. And uh, this, is, this was collected uh, in Puerto Rico in a jungle area. And this is looking down in the jungle in the image, uh, red is high, and uh, or the, the dark red is high, and then deeper down is uh, blue, and then ultimately, ultimately red again. And uh, so this will run in, as a movie. Since you get the range information and angle information for everything that is, is on the ground, and since you're, the receivers are so sensitive that you can detect photons, uh, you can imagine light reflecting from the ground, from tree leaves, from various uh, uh, objects within, and then allowing you to synthetically fly underneath the data to see what's going on. So that was a jungle. And this is a synthetic uh, flight through or walk through the jungle, uh, through the trees, uh, down a trail. And uh, once you're in there, you can start exploring for things. And you'll see shortly, there's another small trail. You can see a wire there. And then as we get uh, closer, we can uh, move up and see there's a, a tent and a, an encampment. And uh, for this test, that was meant to be a, a surrogate uh, drug factory. And then, because you have range information, you can time gate out the trees and reveal things that are on the ground. So a, a dramatically new capability that was rapidly developed, but the fundamental technology took about a decade to develop. So uh, the message is we, we really need to, f to find those technology areas uh, and uh, make those long-term investments and, and take the risks we need and, and also recognize not all of them are going to pay off. But this is one example of something that paid off in a big way. Uh, another application, next chart with avalanche photodiode arrays. This is one that uh, we hadn't envisioned in the early days of the technology development, and, and it was for uh, systems for communications, for laser communication. And one of the applications was for NASA, and this is a system that was developed as a part of the Lunar Laser Comm demonstration for the Lunar Atmosphere and Dust Environment Explorer, or LADI. This was a probe launched around 2013 to orbit the moon in a, in a, a low orbit to collect lunar dust for some science experiments. And it turned out they had uh, some payload available to put a little pod on the side. So on the upper left-hand side of the chart, there's a little gold-covered uh, uh, pod, which has a, a laser a system and a receiver. And then in the lower uh, left-hand corner, there's the ground terminal. Uh, in this case, there were photon detectors that were based on something called uh, superconducting nanowire arrays. So they were faster to reset than the avalanche photodiode arrays. And the way they worked is you'd, you'd have a, a mesh of wires that were biased uh, just to be superconducting. And then when one photon would hit them, they'd go out of the superconducting model, and then you can detect that, and they'd reset the superconducting very quickly. So with the, the superconducting sensing and receivers in the ground terminal being so sensitive, you could create a capability on the, on the probe that used a very low power. And uh, what I find amazing with this is the program demonstrated the communication from the moon down to the earth at just over 600 megabits per second on half a watt of laser power. So you can just imagine all the DOD applications that might be possible uh, with that. But again, uh, a system, a dramatically new uh, capability uh, based on technology that took a decade to develop. And uh, there are many, many more applications of, of these photon counting uh, systems that uh, I can't go into here in detail. But, but uh, uh, long-term investments in technology are, are clearly needed for things like this. Next chart. So I, I thought I would talk about this parallel path for, for rapid development as a, a third topic. And uh, this is a model that was developed back for needs in Iraq and Afghanistan for the, the counter IED fight. And the idea here was to uh, create a situation with, uh, with funding from the Joint IED Defeat Organization or the Air Force Rapid Capabilities Office or uh, the Army Rapid Equipping Force to have centers where you would have uh, very talented people on retainer, in a sense, with a very broad statement of work to develop technology to counter IEDs. And the approach would be if the threat changed. So, so in many cases, the IED threat changed by the month or every couple of months. And there was just no time to go through uh, the usual acquisition approach of an AOA and then a competition and then you know getting the money out there and getting something new to, developed. So this is a way of responding 
uh, rapidly to a, a rapidly changing threat. So in the concept engineering box, there would be a, a small team of people, maybe five, eight at most, not 30, not 50 people that would do some lean red teaming and blue teaming, looking at the threat to figure out what to do about the IED uh, challenges, maybe the triggers or, or the, the bomb approach uh, as it evolved over time. And then if an idea looked viable, then a program manager could say, take the money that you have as a part of that broad statement of work and develop something fast. And it'd be, we, call, we called it colloquially skunkworks prototyping, but that was meant to cover the uh, integration of hardware people, software people, manufacturing people, all, the, all that talent working side by side to create something with a very short spec and then uh, in parallel to that, have the Army test community. So ATEC would be watching and then provide an operationally adequate approval to transition something into operations very quickly, sometimes within days of the prototype being done. And it would go out into operations. And in many cases, we could have people ready to catch, uh, armed forces on the ground ready to accept the new system to, to try it out. In almost all cases, within a week or two of the new system going out into theater, there'd be a phone call that would come back along the lines of uh, what you sent out here was, was okay, but what we really wanted was something else. Or it didn't really work that well. False alarm rate was too high or it was too complicated, we couldn't use it. Could you fix it? So then there would be this rapid feedback path shown in the upper part of the chart where the software would be modified or even the hardware in some cases to get it right. And then when the operational community was happy with it, and there'd be a transition into a more typical acquisition approach. But what was transitioned was not a 200-page spec. What was transitioned was a three-page spec, with the prototype being the existence proof of this is what can be done, and we really ought to start with that. And uh, so quite a bit uh, over about, uh, about seven, eight years, there were about two dozen systems that went through this process uh, with various organizations, and there were uh, new systems that uh, moved very rapidly out uh, into theater. It was controversial. Uh, it required top cover from uh, Ash Carter when he was undersecretary and Frank Kendall later uh, to protect it. Uh, some of the pushback was around you know, all the dot mil PF documentation and all that, so almost none of that was being done. Uh, the spec was short. Uh, the sustainment issue wasn't a major problem because many of, the, many of the systems were being used for six months and then the threat changed and something else would be replacing them. So it was a model that, that worked reasonably well for that threat, uh, for the scale of systems needed. You wouldn't develop F35 with this, but you could develop F35 electronic protection algorithms this way or uh, subcomponents of major systems uh, out there. So this is a model that's been tried. Uh, we've been working with uh, Ellen Lord and, and uh, with Mike Griffin and, and Pat Shanahan and others to find ways of embedding approaches like this uh, throughout the community for things that might, uh, might be needed very rapidly. Uh, next chart. And just to give you some examples, uh, so Constant Hawk was upgraded rapidly multiple times to, uh, with a very high pixel count camera system to look down at the ground and uh, collect data at about one hertz. And the idea was if there were an IED event on the ground, it could go back in time with the data it was, collected, uh, it was collecting to find out uh, where the vehicles may have come from that placed uh, the, the bomb and then uh, maybe discover uh, networks. Another system, Radiant, Fal Radiant Falcon, uh, there was a group that developed a, a UHF uh, SAR, synthetic aperture radar capability, to uh, look for signatures on the ground related to IEDs. Uh, there were rapid developments for the J-Crew jammers that were deployed out in the theater. There were some problems that were uh, e evolved and, and uh, fixed very quickly through that process. And then in the Air Force with advanced uh, electronic warfare needs, there are a whole range of new systems moving through that approach to adapt electro electronic warfare capabilities within a matter of weeks to months rather than, than years because uh, that threat is, is, of course, moving very quickly. So there are a whole range of stories around various approaches like this, but, but uh, this is one way of getting innovation into the hands of the operational community very quickly and then to get that feedback to get it right so that they, they end up having what they, they need in the near term. Next chart. Another approach uh, for driving innovation uh, is this overlap with the academic community. And with Lincoln and, and many of us in the New England area, we're very fortunate to have uh, very strong schools around that we can uh, connect to. There's a very strong research and development community across the region. 
Uh, we, Lincoln Laboratory, have been connecting uh, very closely with MIT, of course, but also others. And there's a new uh, node at the edge of MIT uh, called the Beaver Works. The MIT mascot is the beaver, so it's Beaver Works like Skunk Works or Phantom Works. And the idea is to have a facility where you have classroom space, uh, prototyping space, integration space, where students, faculty, and research staff from Lincoln and elsewhere can come together and prototype something uh, at a scale that they wouldn't normally do in their classroom uh, work. And, and they would do this over about a semester. And the plot on this chart is just showing uh, a number of what we call capstone projects. We can get money from the Navy or the Air Force, sometimes from the Army at the scale of 100 to 150K for, st for students to prototype something. And then when they're done, the result goes to Lincoln or elsewhere where something classified can be added and it's rapidly transitioned uh, into operations. It's a great way to develop students to think about projects and learn how to fail and get through the failures and ultimately succeed. And then uh, for all of us, uh, many of the students get interested in national security work and, and uh, they move into companies or laboratories to work longer term. So it's, there's been a big benefit from the, this kind of model. Next chart. So I wanted to show you one result. Uh, one was uh, something called an air-launched micro UAV. And the idea here was to create a very small UAV that can fly about 60 miles an hour for maybe 30 minutes and uh, to make it uh, in a form that you could fold up and put into a, a fighter aircraft to come out of a chaff dispenser. And then uh, you, you can imagine a whole range of things you might put on the micro UAV uh, in the terms of sensing and calm. So we, we made this a student project in the Aero Astro Department at MIT. And the students came up with a design in the upper left-hand corner of the chart. And uh, I, I can't go into the specific uh, transition results, but uh, at a high level, uh, after they were done with this project, it came out to Lincoln. Uh, we added some new uh, dimensions to it. Uh, there was a test out in China Lake uh, about two years ago where three F-18s deployed over 100 of these. Uh, and they deployed over an area. Uh, they were in an autonomous mode where, where they found each other. Uh, some of them died, so they adapted around the, the UAVs that didn't make it. And uh, they did uh, a whole range of interesting operations. And uh, one uh, interesting dimension of this is uh, Ash Carter, as uh, when he was Defense Secretary, decided he wanted 60 minutes to be there with her cameras looking up at everything as was happening. So. Uh, that, that changed the risk calculus a little bit uh, in this. But, but uh, it, it all came together, and, and uh, it did work. And, uh, but the driving force here was really that academic push with the students developing the, the early prototype for this that we could then evolve for direct uh, operational use. And uh, there are many next steps for this that are ongoing right now. So this was one benefit from that model. Another is on the next chart. So we, we gave the students, as a part of a capstone course, the problem of creating a UAV that could land on water and do something and then take off with the, the caveat that very often they crash when they land in the water. So could they do something to, to allow it to recover and take off? So what they did is they put in all the actuators, all the sensing, the processing capability to allow the micro UAV or the smaller UAV to reorient and then take off again. Uh, so a great project for them. And uh, we have uh, at least 10 interesting ideas for what, what to do with this now. So this will now go into the classified domain, and uh, we'll add has some new uh, aspects to it. But another, uh, another example of borrowing from the talent in the academic community to jumpstart some innovation in, in various uh, projects that the DOD needs. So next chart. So the, the last point I wanted to make is in the innovation community, and, and in the laboratory and technology development community, uh, there isn't enough overlap with the operational community. And this has been a challenge to, to develop further. And uh, this was a conversation uh, we had years ago with General Corelli uh, within the Army, and uh, he pushed very hard on this. I, I'm showing this chart here as a Lincoln example. Uh, what we did is we created a military fellows program where at any given time we might have between uh, 40 and 45 military fellows resident at Lincoln for a year or two 
working side by side with our engineers and scientists on these uh, prototyping efforts. And what that helps us to do is to get the initial condition better. They, they help us to get our minds right about what's really needed and, and how they might really use the technology coming out. It's been, a, it's been an enormous benefit to us to have this operational benefit. Uh, we also have every su summer service academy interns. Uh, last summer we had uh, over 75 uh, come in. Uh, we joke that the average age of the lab goes down by about five years in those, those couple months. But they are very energetic. Uh, they, they learn a lot. Uh, we learn from them. But uh, as a general theme, there is not enough overlap between the technology community and the operational community. And uh, we've been uh, pushing very hard to try to fix that. Uh, it's been an uphill climb, uh, but uh, that's something we'll, we'll continue to push on, and, and uh, I think it's a major part of making that development loop uh, work, work better. Next chart. So just to wrap up, we, we covered the, the four main areas in that development loop. Uh, so uh, taking on greater risk uh, systemically within projects, uh, having a sustained investment in technology, having a model for rapid transition and uh, development for various needs, even if there's subcomponents of major systems out there, and then to create this operational overlap. There are other aspects of this loop that need fixed, and there's a much larger briefing that goes into some of those, those needs. Uh, but if I were to pick four, uh, these are the four I'd, I'd focus on. So with that, uh, I'll stop. I appreciate your attention. So thank you. Are there any questions at all? Over here. Yeah, so this is a big problem. Uh, so in the tra traditional model, we'll develop software. There will be a, an algorithm uh, in involved in that usually. And then you, you freeze it, and then it goes off, and, and uh, you test it. Uh, there might be uh, ongoing developmental testing, but ultimately operational testing that, that allows it to be accepted for operational use. The challenge for learning systems is even after you do the final operational testing, they go off, and they're still learning. And, and so the challenge is, how do, you, how do you create the boundaries to ensure that the system doesn't go off the map in performance in, in operational roles? And uh, there's some good thoughts around how that might be done, but that's still uh, not completely a solved problem. And there are cultural aspects to accepting systems that have gone through you know, new processes like that. And, and the, the, there are approaches that involve processors running in parallel, watching the learning system to ensure that it's, it's staying within the bounds uh, needed. Uh, there are thoughts around having a, a, a black box uh, a processor connected so if something does go wrong, you have all the data to figure out what happened to fix it rapidly. Uh, but it's, it's a complex problem. Uh, it's a needed problem. And uh, so the challenge for us is that our adversaries may not be as, as uh, as constrained as we might be for things like this. And so we have to figure out how to adapt uh, you know, around a, a different uh, ethical model and maybe a, you know, operational model, but uh, ensure that we, we can rely on these systems. Uh, but, but we have to figure it out. We, we, we just can't uh, avoid uh, learning systems in, in the future capabilities we have to have. Um, other questions? Over here. Uh, Dr. You talked about uh, the lab interaction with the industry to keep all of this and thinking about how much of this is being done in this way, our award, and the transition to the technology. Where does that fit in? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Uh, so, uh, our our main initiative that has been developing over the past uh, two or three years has been to figure out how to transition more technology out of Lincoln to startups and small to medium-sized companies. Uh, I mentioned uh, uh, a, a few hundred million dollars coming out of, of Lincoln every year to buy things that we integrate into prototypes. Uh, almost, uh, in, depends, depending on, on uh, various projects from year to year, between a half and two-thirds of that money go to small and medium-sized companies now. And uh, so we've really benefited by, by pulling in some of those innovative uh, approaches under development on the outside. In fact, I saw quite a few systems out here in the display areas that uh, I was very intrigued by. And uh, 
Uh, what we're planning on, on creating in the next year and a half is uh, an incubator space right at the edge of Lincoln where small companies can come and live in part next to us, uh, use our facilities like our microelectronics facilities or our UAV test ranges or compact ranges for electromagnetic measurement, and then uh, uh, work with us to get something uh, into uh, closer into a product form that can be then uh, uh, used for the, you know, the DOD to buy into later on. Uh, so we, we think that uh, although we continue to transition to the major primes out in industry, that uh, in the modern world we have to uh, do a better job transitioning to small and medium-sized companies as, as well. Um, uh, you can, I'm, I'm sure, all find our website. We have a, we have a component of the website now that has uh, all the information for small companies that might be interested in what we're working on and uh, how they might connect to the various projects we have. And so we, we, uh, we strongly encourage anybody here to, to uh, check that out. Uh, any other questions? All right, thank you. So, Dr. Evans, thank you very much for being with us this morning. Appreciate your comments and remarks. As a token of our appreciation, we have for you the coveted Sinidia coin. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Thank you again, and thank you for your leadership at, at, at Lincoln. It's, it's truly a national resource, and we're just thrilled to have you uh, right here in our backyard. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Paul. Yeah.